Good morning, everybody. I am Abby Elizabeth, and this is the Earth and Vessels YouTube channel. This channel is for Christian women, but anyone is welcome to listen. I want to talk to you, my sisters, today about why God made women. And verily, there's a lot of misunderstanding these days about men and women and, and even basic truths that men and women are different. And you know, uh, as Christians, we hold to the word of God because it's good for us. When we're obedient to the scripture, there is much grace and beauty and, and blessing that comes upon a woman. When a woman is not adhering to the scriptures, there is much ugliness and, and pain and sorrow that surrounds her. So for that reason, as Christian women, we want to know what the scripture says so that we can bring ourselves into uh, the beauty that God ordained for a Christian woman to have. However, most of us, if not all of us, were born into a system that is Marxist and feminist in its nature. So Marxism and feminism is, is the theology of Satan. And what it does is it inverts the relationship between men and women, it turns it upside down. And because of this, many of us have some pretty deep misunderstandings about what it means to be a woman, what it means to be a Christian. And for that reason, I thought that I would go over it with you today in a video. So one thing that we want to understand to, to start off with is why did God create women? Well. First of all, let's go to Genesis, and please turn with me in your Holy Bible, if, if at all possible. It will bless you if you do. So in the book of Genesis, in the King James Version of the Holy Bible, which is the Word of God if you speak English, let's read in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him an help meet for him. It's common practice currently for people to change the word here from help meet to help mate. And, and verily, the meanings of those two things are very, very different. Meet, when it is spelled M-E-E-T, means suitable fitting. Under a Marxist feminist dogma, women are taught that to be a servant unto their husband is discrimination, it's oppression, and verily many women get insulted even at the idea of being a servant unto their husband. The first answer I would give to that though, my sisters, is that Jesus Christ himself came in the form of a servant. He washed the disciples' feet as an example of how Christians should treat one another. And women should not, who are Christians should not at all be offended by the idea of being a suitable servant unto their husband. When we are in rebellion though, this can seem to us like beneath us, that why should we have to consider ourselves any different in terms of our role from a man. Now, God loves men and women just equally. There's no difference in how much he loves his people, whether they be male or female. He did, however, ordain roles for men and women, and the reason is very important. And that's a good deal of what I want to talk about in this video today. And we're going to get to this, but I need to kind of go along with the, the basic ideas before we get to that. So again, the first concept we want to understand is why God made women. And a lot of people stop here at Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. And they say, well, the woman was created for the man, which is absolutely true, and I'm not contending with that. But there are other things about why the woman was created. 
So let's go now to the book of Proverbs. And let's read in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 4. The Lord hath made all things for himself. Yea, even the wicked in the day of evil. So, or pardon me, even the wicked for the day of evil. Pardon me, my sisters. God made everything for himself, for his glory. Whether we're talking about trees or butterflies or ladybugs or the ocean or the stars or the planets or men and women. We were all made for his glory. And especially when we're talking about the part of creation that is mankind, we want to understand that, yes, the man was made in the image and glory of God, but the woman was taken out of the man. And when that happened, they both then were lacking certain attributes that had originally been entirely in the man. And we can read of this. Let's turn again to Genesis chapter 2, and now let's read verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. You see, when God created mankind, he created them male and female. Let's go now to Genesis chapter 5 and begin in verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. You see, Adam was made in the image of God. And when Eve was taken out of Adam, then Adam and Eve were in the image of God when they came together, when they came together in marriage. Now, am I saying that people who are not married are not in the image of God. No, I'm not saying that. And please don't accuse me of that. What I'm saying, though, is that the picture of marriage is very important. That union between a man and a woman is given to us by God so that we can understand God's relationship to his people. I want to turn now to, again, to Genesis chapter 2, and, and let's read, starting in verse um, 23. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. See, when Adam said, he said, this is now bone of my bones. He wasn't referring to the fact that Eve had been formed from his rib. Rather, what he was speaking of is that he was taking her to be his wife. And this is when the ordinance of marriage began, right in the very beginning. It's important for us to recognize that this is very important to God, that he made men and women for each other. But the woman was made to be a suitable, suitable helper for her husband. And the man was made to be a picture of the relationship between Jesus Christ and his church, or in the Old Testament, between God and Israel. 
when we're considering marriage as Christians, and I, I'm going to focus on it in terms of Christians now, let's go to Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, and let's read here um, about um, marriage. And we'll start here in verse 28. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. So here we see, of course, that a husband and wife are one flesh. That they are, before God, they are considered to be one. They have been brought together in matrimony, and until death do they part, they are one flesh. This is the doctrine of marriage, and even the heathen understand this but many Christians no longer do. So let's read now in verse 29. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. Here we can see that Jesus Christ cherishes those who are his faithful disciples, those who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, and have had their sins remitted by being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and have received the Holy Spirit of the living God to dwell in them, that Jesus Christ and his church, those are the people who are his church, it's not found in the hypocritical Pharisee-like denominations of the world. The true church are people who have not only obeyed the gospel, and had their sins remitted, receiving the Holy Spirit of the living God to dwell inside of them by being baptized in water and spirit in Jesus' name. So they're now in covenant with Jesus Christ. This is the true church. And those people, Jesus Christ nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as a husband nourishes and cherishes his wife. Let's read on here. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. One thing that is very unpopular to speak these days is that men and women are different. And, and you know, there's all kinds of nonsense out there, and I'm not getting into that right now. But basically, men and women are very different. And that is not something that has changed. And while in the scripture we can read that in the kingdom of God there is neither male or female, that is not talking about gender roles. Rather, firstly, that's talking about that women are just as important to men, to God as men are. Um, it's also a reference to the fact that in the resurrection, there will no longer be marriage. There will no longer be men and women, and we will be as the angels. So, but aside from that, and I'm not getting into that right now, what I'm really talking about now is why God made women. And the most important thing that we want to grasp is that women were made to be in the image of God, to be suitable servants unto their husbands, and to be a picture of the Holy Bride of Christ, the Christian Church. I want to now go to Revelation 17 to talk about the other reason why God made women. And let's begin in verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. So in the Bible, there's 
the way a woman, a godly woman, pictures the relationship of 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 um, God's people to God or t the Christians to Jesus Christ. So that 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 woman is pictured as a godly woman, a chaste virgin, a bride, and that she is holy and without blemish, that she is unspotted. See, this is one reason a woman, God made women, was to be a picture of the Christian church, of God's holy people. The second reason is for women who are not thus to picture uh, the false church. Now, the false church has been around since the time of Cain. It's that seed that murders its brother. It's that seed that worships fallen angels, other gods. It's that seed that is selfish and brazen and verily causes much suffering in the earth. It's the seed that murdered Jesus Christ. It's known in our time as Antichrist. It's the false, hypocritical, whoring religions that call themselves the church, but they are not. This is the whore of Babylon. Now let's read on here about the whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Here we can see that a fornicating woman, so a prostitute, some woman who is unmarried, who is having sex with a bunch of men, is a picture of the whore of Babylon. And the wine of her fornication is the false doctrine, the false religion that makes people drunk. Now, anyone who has any experience with religious people knows that they are indeed drunk on all kinds of false doctrines, and many of them pertain to marriage. The reason why many of their false doctrines pertain to marriage is because it's the Antichrist system, and the Antichrist system wars against the truth. And so it twists the word of God and changes words and so forth to say things like, you can repent of your marriage, or um, it's okay for a woman to put away her husband, even though that doesn't happen in the scripture. Godly women realize that they are bound by the law unto their husband for as long as he lives. And this is written in Romans chapter 7, verse 2, and elsewhere. Jesus Christ clearly spoke this. There is no doubt in the word of God that adultery is something that will get a woman to, and a man, anyone who commits it, to, to end up in the lake of fire. But the false church is a hypocritical, uh, cheap imitation of the bride of Christ. So let's read on here. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. This is the world ecumenical religious system that includes everybody except for the true bride of Christ. Now let's read on. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. You see, this religious system, that it, and it exists right now in the global ecumenical system where all the religions have gathered together once again under the Roman Catholic Pope, that these churches are false churches. 
they teach twisted doctrine. They, they have presented to people multiple false translations of God's word that change the word of God in order to make excuse for all kinds of abominations and filthiness. You see, when Rome created the false church, excuse me, my sisters, I had a cat situation I had to deal with. So um, when Rome at the Council of Nicaea under Emperor Constantine made um, made a new form of paganism whereby they they coerced and, and tricked and, and uh, bribed people who wanted to be Christians into thinking into thinking that they could get more people into Christianity by entering into the temples of the pagan gods by um, making all kinds of religious compromises, such as renaming certain statues from things like Jupiter into, um, you know, a Christian God, you see. So what they did was they took, say, for example, Mary, who was a human woman, not a goddess of any kind, and she was a sinner just like the rest of us. The only man who was ever without sin I mean, Adam was without sin until he sinned, but the only human being who was ever without sin after that was Jesus Christ. And Mary was his mother and she was definitely blessed, but she was not some kind of immaculate um, uh, non-sinner goddess who was the mother of God. That concept comes from paganism. And that, of course, would be the goddess Diana or the goddess Ishtar or the goddess Ashtoreth, or the goddess Semiramis, or the, you know, on and on and on and on. That this goddess, this mother goddess that, that people then began to worship, you know, the one holding the infant, actually originated before the flood, before the flood came. And people who bow down before statues like that, doesn't matter what you, what name you put on it. You're not worshiping Jesus. You're not worshiping Mary, the mother of God. You're worshiping an ancient evil spirit that masquerades as the divine feminine. So at any rate, the, the other reason why God has made women is that women also can be a picture of this false church. Now, throughout the scripture, there are many examples of holy women. There are women who were widows and prophetesses. There were women who were wives, who were virgins. There were women who were prostitute. There was a prostitute named Rahab who, who repented of that and was actually part of the lineage of Jesus Christ. And then there was a widow named Ruth who who was actually not even of the nation of Israel, who is also of the lineage of Jesus Christ. There were um, women who were, there was a woman who was a judge. There was a, a, a widow who was a prophetess who, who uh, prophesied uh, when she was in the temple, being a very elderly woman. There are, in the Bible, there are elder women who teach younger women, but women, have been called to many things, but most importantly, what a woman is called to be is a picture of Jesus Christ's relationship to his church by the way they serve their husband, by the way they conduct themselves. You see, whether you have a husband or not, a Christian woman behaves herself with modesty, with, with soft speech, with... Um, with shyness or shamefacedness is another way that that's put in the scripture. But shyness, she's demure, she's tender-hearted, she's kind, she's soft. You see, but these days most women think that to be that way is an indication that you're in some kind of slavery, and they have great contempt for it. God made all things for His glory. He made 
men and women to be, when they come together in marriage, to be a picture of how much he loves his people. And women, the way that we conduct ourselves is an example to the whole world of what a Christian is really like. And that's why it's so important that we hold ourselves to these principles. Having gone into kind of the fundamentals of what um, I'm talking about here, I'm going to pause this video now and I'm going to move right along and do part two of this message. So um, I hope this first part of this message has blessed you. And please, uh, after you watch this, watch part two of it. Because verily, there's more to be said about this topic, and I don't want to have to rush about it. And I want you also to be able to get it in manageable bites, so to speak. So I look forward to uh, continuing this message on the other side. In Jesus' name, may this word go forth today and edify many. Amen.